Welcome to the On the Purple Couch podcast, Annie Sloan. Hello. Annie, I am so excited to sit with you in this lovely um, stockist shop. We're in Tallahassee, Florida, and I understand you just did a really nice fair. What I've that done, about? Yes, I've done two-day fair here, and I've done uh, workshops two days, and some book signings, and some Q&A sessions. It's been amazing. I just can't believe that you and I are sitting in this place, and we're in Florida together talking. We've met many other places, including in England, we have. and uh, you've just been in South Africa and Zimbabwe, so yes. the whole thing is amazing. It has been a wonderful journey for me. As you know, we have been a stockist for you for the past five years, and it has honestly been an honor uh, to work with you. And uh, It works both ways. Though. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll say for my audience, you guys know um, I love Annie Sloan Chalk Paint, and if you're listening, you do too. Um, and uh, this is the woman. This is the woman behind it. We all know about chalk paint. We know there's no stripping, no priming, no sanding. We know all the beautiful properties. You can paint just about anything, fabrics included. You guys have seen that in the shop. And if you're listening outside of the D.C. area, of course, you can check with your local stockist at chalkpaint.com and find somebody local to you to get the paint. This interview, I wanted an opportunity for us to get a sense of who is Annie Sloan? What is and what are some of her motivations? Who is she? What does she come? Where does she come from? And of course, we're going to talk free, so if we make mistakes, we'll just back it up and start over again. Annie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? And it's purposely open-ended. Okay. Well, I, um, I, ah, oh, well, I'm Australian. No, I'm not. I'm English. No, I'm not. I'm, uh, I do that, I sort of feel very much from the world. Yeah. Um, I've spent a long time now in Oxford in England, so mm-hmm. I'm probably pretty English. I was born mm-hmm. in Australia. Um, but I have got sort of, um, I've travelled quite a lot, so I've, I've been lots of places, I've done lots of things. And I think I'm, I mean, you know, I, I'm not, I'm a certain type of person, I suppose, but I hope I'm quite broad-minded, I hope. Um, and... Um, and I'm quite old now. I'm getting old. <laughs> I love the way your clothes reflect your lifestyle. Very oh, eclectic, you. very international. Yeah. And uh, got an Indian silk. Um, beautiful. I forgot what this is called, but it's that silk which is woven in yeah. lots of colours. And I've got a, a silky trousers and a t-shirt. I love it. And, I love um, it. I'm, I mean, I'm supposed to be an arty, arty person. You are. Yeah. And it is hot in October. I think it's 80 degrees and I'm all in black. Don't ask me why, but that's just what I brought. And so that's what it is. You have a little bit of a connection to the Fiji Islands. Can you tell us a little bit about that? My mother came from Fiji. Mm -hmm. She was part Fijian, part part Spanish from Mm -hmm. Cuba. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, she was, she, she's, her mother came from New Caledonia, spoke Mm -hmm. French. So she was always an outsider. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, she was, I think she was an outsider, and I've always felt an outsider. She married my father in New Zealand, and my father was a sort of journalist, um, and again, quite a sort of creative sort of man. Mm-hmm. He was always at odds with everybody. Um, I think that's always me. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm an insider, but I'm an outsider. Mm-hmm. I'm an insider because I like people and I can mm-hmm. talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. But I'm an outsider in that I'm not, I'm not, I was going to say, conventional, but I am quite conventional. I don't know. I'm contradicting myself all the time. (laughs) But that's the way of the world. We are all mixing and trying to blend all the different aspects about ourselves. People know that about me in the shop. I mean, I was born in Boston. My parents are from West Africa. I lived in Paris. I've lived in Mauritius. I also want to believe I'm a person of the world. Well, that's why. I thrive in that. We relate to each other because you're um, you, you you were at school in England at one point, weren't you? My mother was in school. Your in mother was in school mm-hmm. in England, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you're French speaking, mm-hmm. so Absolutely. you're a woman of the world, and I think that's a lot to do with stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. This brings us to who you are as a mother. You're a mother of four, three, three, three boys, three boys, grandmother of two, and can I just tell you, you seem to be three. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Grandmother of three. Yeah. And then you are professionally a decorative painter. Yeah. You've been trained in the fine arts. Yeah. You um, are recently completed a course in French. Oh, I don't know about that. What I do is we, at the workshop, a, a warehouse, mm-hmm. we call it our warehouse. Mm-hmm. It's actually, it's in Oxford. 
It's the, where we make the paint mm -hmm. in England. We also make it in America and South Africa. Mm -hmm. But um, at the warehouse where we make the paint, we've also got all our studios and workshops and all the rest of it. Everything happens there. Mm -hmm. And we also do, um, we do French for beginners and intermediate. Oh. Oh, I'm intermediate. That's right. I'm just only just intermediate. <laughs> I love the spirit of learning. But you are all these things. Yeah. And now, not now, for the past 26, 27 years, yeah. I should have mentioned that you're an author, but you are the developer and maker of chalk paint. And yeah. I don't want to get too deep into it, but chalk paint is really Annie Sloan paint, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what made you get into this paint. I, you know, people ask me a lot, and I really... Just one of those things that evolved. I think at that time a lot of people were talking about different sorts of paint. I'd written a book called um, Classic Paints and Faux Finishes in America, but it was called Traditional Paints and Finishes in England. And so I'd written that book. I'd written a book about paints called Paint Alchemy. Mm -hmm. I was really into paints and mm -hmm. how they were made and what was happening. And so one thing led to another, and it wasn't like I... I mean, I did have plans about doing things, but it... I don't know how it happened, right. really. And yeah. now, chalk paint is sold around the world. Yes. I'm really excited about it being in Zimbabwe, South Africa, <laughs> Mauritius, Asia, Europe, <laughs> the UK, America, soon, I'm sure, somehow in South America. It is a product that seems to transcend a lot of things. What is it about you, your your being part of so many different places and experiencing different things, how does that translate into the paint being accepted in so many different places? Big question I know. Yeah, I don't really know. I think it's because it was made in the first place for people to be creative. And my books are about making people able to do it. I don't ask people to be able to draw. I expect people just to want to do it for the love of it. But I also think that I've tapped into something that people always had. And that's what I was interested in in the first place. Actually, I've never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. It's something I've always... I got interested in why were farmers in Sweden, say, uh, painting their benches and making paint out of eggs, and making paint out of milk. Okay. Why did they do that? It's because everybody has a desire to paint mm -hmm. and make their house nicer. Whether you've got, you know, whether you're the Queen of England, uh, or, you know, I've taught, um, you know, lay duchesses, mm -hmm. um, because they wanted to paint something nice in their house. And I've also taught people who are absolutely have no money at all, mm -hmm. and they want to do it. So I think it's something that everybody wants to do. There's a big desire to make your house nice. This point about home, these are one of the questions as I was preparing for this time with you. I started thinking about, let me back up. I first got introduced to chalk paint after getting married and buying a home. And our home was very nice and everything was done, but I needed some color. I needed to actually do my kitchen cabinets. And that's how I found chalk paint. The concept of home and you, where in the world are you most at home? Oh, golly. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, I find myself being able to be at home anywhere. Um, uh, I really do. I don't um I yeah, I can I can make it work anywhere. My mother was like that, I could do that. My mother was, you know, born in Fiji and not a very special family, just quite an ordinary family. And then she was at one point running a farm in England mm -hmm. and you know, cold and wet and she did that. And I think I, I've done that too. I can, you know, it, it, uh, when we bought, first bought our, we've got a house in France which we bought for nothing but mm -hmm. very little. And, you know, I loved it. Actually, one of my favorite times in my life when I had the kids there, we were, they were all little, mm -hmm. and um, there was no running water at the time. So mm -hmm. I had to go outside to get running water yes. and bring it in. I felt like a peasant farmer. Right, right. I actually liked it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I was doing it year on, year out, I perhaps wouldn't have done, so I don't mm -hmm. want to romanticize it. Um, and it. But there was something very nice about it. We went out and got, got um, twigs and to make the fires and stuff. So I, and my husband went back, came back because he was working in London. He came back and said, you're enjoying this, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I do, I like it. It's being close to the earth, maybe. It's being close to the earth, yeah, mm -hmm. I like And I, mm -hmm. one of the things I said, if I, if I hadn't done what I'd done, I probably, I've always said to my husband, I wanted to do a market garden. 
Okay. I like growing things. Okay. I don't have a chance to do now. Yeah. But I do love getting my hands dirty and, mm-hmm. and growing. Annie, you mentioned your mom. You mentioned your husband, who's your business partner, and your children. Some of them are in the business. Who has influenced you in your life goals? Not necessarily about the paint. It could be, but who has influenced you in your life, in sort of where you find yourself today? Um, I probably, it's, you know, it's probably my father. I suppose my parents, really. But my father did believe in me hugely. I was um, his only daughter. He, I, did, I have a brother, but he's 10 years younger than me. Um, and so we, we weren't close. I, you know, I didn't grow up with him. Mm-hmm. I did, mm-hmm. but not really. And so my father um, just, I don't know, he, he, he was a very uh, outspoken, very warm and very uh, talkative. He used to tell me how much he loved me, mm. which I think is something that uh, not everybody gets, mm. especially this is, you know, in the 50s. Yes. Um, people, men didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he did tell me that. He was talked about art a lot. He showed me lots of art. He had lots of art. Mm-hmm. He talked about color a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think those things must have just entered me, you know. And we had um, paintings, I mean, prints of paintings around the house. And so those are the things that probably... And I just believed I was an artist from a very early age. Or something to do with that. It's funny, they talk about um, a lot young people the things that young entrepreneurs, in our case, being being that you're a huge supporter of small businesses, um, that entrepreneurs, people sort of speak into their lives, into their children's, what they desire them to be. In um, my family, in my father's family, and people may or may not know, my father's family is from Nigeria, West Africa, and growing up, the older aunts would tell somebody, you're going to be this, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to do banking. And so you speak those careers or those attributes or values or whatever wow. into their lives. And that makes me think um, when you talk about your dad at that time expressing love for his daughter and encouraging you to go on into the arts. When you think about young entrepreneurs, and if you have, do you have any advice or thoughts for people often ask about uh, advice for girls. I'm going to say girls and boys. Yes. Young entrepreneurs. People that want to do something. They could be young. Any age um, I in the think young. Under 40. You could under 40. Say. I think yeah. if people want to do what they want to do, they just have to be prepared to work. And I think that's one of the big things. You have to work and you have to work and you have to work. Mm-hmm. You have to work very hard. And you have to be obsessed. A little bit obsessed. And Obsessed doesn't mean that you work 24 hours a day. I don't mean that. I just mean consistently. And you can't go away and go, oh, I, oh, I didn't, I'm a musician. I mean, I meet a lot of kids who are like, I'm a musician. Yeah, I haven't got around to writing any songs yet. But, oh, I, I play, play the guitar all day. I don't know, I'm using that. But sure. you know what I mean? Sure. It's, um, you've got to go out and you've got to, and you've got to tell the world about yourself as well. There's a lot involved in it. And it is just a matter of, of working. I mean, there is no other... There is no, it, I know some people are incredibly lucky, mm-hmm. but I, I, there is that thing. It's 90% perspiration and 1% inspiration. And I that is... That. I mean, you know, people have written books about this. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, I have. I will say I've been very obsessed and worked very hard. You've done this going on 30 years yeah. in total. Has there ever been a time, and of course life is that, so I'm sure you have, have you ever been at a crossroads in your life, and how did you break through it? Oh, gosh, yes. Um, There was a point, it was after um, 9-11, after 2000, after the millennium, Mm -hmm. everything went quiet, nobody spent money, and there was one other thing, big banking crisis. Yes. Everything collapsed, and I thought, how are we going to survive? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, there's another crisis at the moment with retail. But I think what you have to do is you, you don't spend. Mm-hmm. Don't spend. You sell, sell, sell. That's what I concentrated on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we were really, really bad. I just thought of all the good things. Someone had told me, and be, this had been going on for a while, but someone had said to me, your paint, um, your paint's the best thing in the world. Best paint in the world. Mm-hmm. 
and I wrote that on the front of my shop, mm -hmm. the best page in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I put that on my website. Mm -hmm. um, I was just positive, positive, positive. Yes. People came to my shop and said, how's it going? I'd go, fantastic, right. great. <laughs> <laughs> and partly I'm an optimist, okay. but I'm not, I'm a realist as well, mm -hmm. but I'm someone, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, if someone came in my shop, I wouldn't go, yeah, it's really bad. I would always right. go, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and a very, very supportive husband as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's how I survived. And also, I didn't have a choice. Right. right. I love that work, work, and work, and be prepared to work. Yeah. In my small five years tenure as a business, as a shop owner, um, this is one of the hardest jobs in the world. I love it. And yeah. the amount of work that... Um, was needed, is needed, yeah. is uh, amazing. It, it is it's truly incredible. amazing. But, yeah, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, I've never, there is no other job like it. I think it's incredible. Yeah. I love the positive af affirmations. I love the believing in yourself. And you have to. You ha it seems to be, if you talk to anybody, read anything about people who have pressed through and worked through things, one of the things you keep hearing is that internal motivation, mm -hmm. that voice that keeps going even when mm -hmm. um, seemingly around might be hard. Um, so, did you ever want to throw in the towel? I dare ask that question. I thought I was going to have to throw in the towel. I thought I was going to have to do something else. I was thinking, what the hell can I do? And I can always go to teaching. I mean, I've been a teacher. Mm -hmm. I've done teaching. I've taught in uh, um, all sorts of you know, kids, the big kids a little bit. Mm -hmm. I could always do that, um, but my heart wouldn't have been in it. And I was like, I don't want to be a failure. Mm -hmm. Stop, you know, I can yes. do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, if, um, and I, yeah, I mean, I don't mean that if I'd closed my shop, I would have done something else, mm -hmm. but, you know, I would have, yeah, I don't know quite what I'm saying now. Annie, you know, I want to talk about something in terms of who you are and what you've brought to your business practice. You chose a model, a dissemination strategy, yeah. to put your paints in small mom and pop shops yeah. like my shop yeah. on the Purple Couch, like the shop that we're at in Lisa's shop here in Tallahassee. What, what made you do that, and, and what was the, yeah. the the background of that? And what I'm hoping that that people who are listening might be thinking about their own businesses or their own lives. What made you do something which I think is quite radical even now? It's still radical. In fact, I think it's even more radical now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. Because I totally, totally believe in independent shops. Mm -hmm. I believe in places. If they're, they're a little bit of theatre, that's what I think. Okay. And so, and I mean, this shop here, where we are, we're in the middle of nowhere, but yes. people come from miles to do it, yes. to, to visit it. It's because it's an interesting place. And it is to do with locations. There are shops that... I had a shop where it wasn't working, but then I chose another place, and it is working. Mm -hmm. But it is, and you have to adapt, and you have to do all sorts of things. But I do believe in communities. I believe in people. I think that if I lived in a big city, I need to go to little shops near, me, near, near me that I can go and talk to. I mean, where I am, I'm in Oxford, and there are little shops around me. There's a little clothes shop that I go mm -hmm. to. I can buy my clothes online, but I love go. I do buy my clothes online, mm -hmm. but I also mm -hmm. love going to her shop mm -hmm. because she's... Um, She's very personable, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm, talk, mm -hmm. she's got a nice ethos, mm -hmm. she, she's, um, she's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's uh, Indigo mm -hmm. Designs in Carly Road. Shout Carly out Road. for Indigo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, and, you know, and so for that reason I will go to her. And, right. and there are other shops like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I totally believe in that. Um, I hate the idea that I will never go shopping again, that I will buy everything online. And there is a company that I actually, I buy toast clothes. I love toast. I love clothes. toast. Love. But, do you know what? There is a shop in Oxford, mm -hmm. and I visit it. Mm -hmm. I look at the stuff. I've been at that shop. Yeah, there you are. I so love I, toast. I touch her clo yeah. clothes, and I, I love it. She's a woman, independent woman like myself, but mm -hmm. the age of me. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's done it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. She's got stores, which are her own mm -hmm. stores. Mine aren't the same at all. But, mm -hmm. So I'm supporting other women. Yeah. Um... I suppose it was the, the idea of just visiting nice shops. I just love it. Um, and 
uh, and community. I love villages. I love places where people are, are talking to friends. Uh, we were in a, in a... I didn't want this ever to happen. We were in a village outside of Oxford at one point, and the village store closed. That was a store where you got your your stamps, and you'd send mm. your letters from, so there was a post office there. You could get your bread or whatever mm-hmm. you wanted. You could also get a whole dinner there if mm-hmm. you'd forgotten or whatever, or friends. It was a great place. Mm-hmm. And I would go there and um, I would meet all the old people in the village mm. and young people as well. Yeah. I mean, everybody in the village yeah. in clothes. Mm. That for me was the end of the village. Yes. It yes. was, I, where was I going to meet people? I might go for a walk, but and I might meet somebody, right. but it, it's not the same as a village store. We are in a very interesting uh, time, and I saw that in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and of course here yeah. in the States. We are in a very, very, I don't know if the right word is conflictual. There seems to be so many things happening and coming at us, but where is the center? Where is the community? Yeah. Yeah. One people find a lot, and I'm always on social media, everybody knows that, but there's another community, right? So social media helps us extend our reach, but there's also our home community. And there seems to be, I don't want to sound like I'm an old person, you know, hoping for yesteryear, but there is something being lost. And I wonder, you know, if small shops are can be part of some sort of revival. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a weird word to use right now because obviously many stores are closing. We all read the papers. We see that. Um but I, I just don't know. But so are the malls. So are the big oh, the malls. malls. So the malls, the malls are malls suffering, Because yeah. nobody wants to go to a mall. No. Who wants to go shopping there? No. I find them horrible. Yeah. But what I do love is coming to somewhere like this, yes. which is very beautiful. It's very calming. Yeah. I can do workshops. So what they're going to be is destination shops yeah. or experiential shops where okay. events go on. So I can go there and I can take part of a workshop. I can yes. do something fun. I can see a demo. Yeah. I mean, I had a workshop here yesterday. There was uh, over 100 people. Well, you it's know, amazing. that's because people, I, we did them each day, yeah. and people wanted to do it. It was fun. It was interesting. Mm-hmm. So people came out. They're not, on, they're not at home. Right. But they didn't go to the mall, right. possibly. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Not, but, you know, and mm-hmm. that's what they like. And villages and towns, there's a town near here, and it's a beautiful town that is mm-hmm. surviving, and you know why, because mm-hmm. it's full of lovely restaurants, mm-hmm. it's full of lovely independent shops. People can go there and they feel good about themselves. Mm-hmm. You do not feel good when you go to the mall because mm-hmm. you feel like it's loud, it's screechy, and it's, you know... It's the same uh, everywhere. And same. it's the same everywhere. I want to go to this little village, this town here, which is called Thomasville, I think. Okay. And it's, it was lovely. Mm-hmm. You know, and other towns apparently are dying. Yeah. And that's yeah. because... They haven't made that little, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. make the, 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 the interesting experiential and, um, and destination place. Mm-hmm. Annie, I want to switch a little bit back to paint, but something that is also an extension of you. In the, over the past um, two weeks, week and a half, you've launched a very exciting project with Oxfam International. Oh, yeah. And oh. what and how did that come about? Well, Oxfam, many people won't know about them if a lot of Americans won't know because I think only 20 to 30 percent of Americans know who Oxfam are. Mm -hmm. So Oxfam are a um, non-political, non-religious charity uh, working to relieve poverty throughout the world. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. They came to me and I couldn't have been more happy. They were looking for a paint person to do something, mm-hmm. and we are the obvious one because okay. we are in Oxford, and they are in Oxford mm. too because it's Ox Fam Oxford Famine. That's where the name comes my from. My goodness, I, I did know. not know that. No, I mean uh, <laughs> even oh English my. people don't know it. In England, you know, England or Britain, where 98% of people know what it is. Wow, so it That's was amazing. amazing. They came to us, and it, it's just been the best thing ever. Um, they gave me a choice of six places to visit, uh, and uh, we're going to work with them for three years. Okay. I chose Ethiopia as mm-hmm. the first place mm-hmm. because I just thought it has such dignity. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love it. Mm-hmm. I talked to you about it. I remember when um, I said, this is happening. <laughs> These are the choices of countries I have. Which one should I choose? <laughs> um, and I won't say what you did choose, but you were saying, be careful of Ethiopia because... There are, there's been, a, there was a, I think there was something that happened some time ago that was a famine or something. And there was, 
So I don't want that because it will be people, and it will be little kids with flies around in poverty. And, and I, I didn't think of that. I thought the, the beauty. I had a friend who was Ethiopian when I was at art school, mm-hmm. and I was just, she was amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so um, I had only good thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that it's the first country that had, um, uh, one of the first countries to have mm-hmm. uh, Christianity. Mm-hmm. Yes. Earlier yes. than earlier than Britain, yes. I think, which is yeah, like they are the first Christians. One amazing. of the first Christians, yes. One of the first Christians. Yes. Come on. Yes. I mean, come on. Yes. Um, it's got. It's never been colonized except mm-hmm. for a short time, mm-hmm. very unsuccessfully by mm-hmm. the, the Italians. Italians. Yeah. It's beautiful country. They make amazing coffee. Yes. I mean, and that's a natural thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we also had fantastic wine world, yes. they? they grow incredible coffee second to South Africa second to South Africa exactly yes. and the wine was incredible yes. and really really good quality uh, fabulous cotton mm-hmm. amazing design work mm-hmm. um, church architecture that you have never seen anything like it it's dug into the, there's one place called mm-hmm. La Libella which is dug into the ground and it's incredible yeah. it really is fantastic and so um for me, and then, of course, and then I found out about the music, mm-hmm. which is this Ethio jazz. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. So, um, for me, it was a country mm-hmm. that it was about joy, and that's why we've come up with this colour called Lem Lem, mm-hmm. which in um, Amharic, which is the, the, the Ethiopian language, means um, to flourish, mm-hmm. to be fertile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was about the onion seed project that. Uh, Oxfam were working with mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the women there, yeah. women farmers. I want to say I am very proud at the presentation you put on, and I did have my reservations. And <laughs> what I have been very glad about over the years is the relationship that we have, that I've been able to be honest. And every you, people know in the shop, and they know my personality, I don't hold back. But I think it was very important, and you did such a beautiful job to show the richness of the culture, the beautiful people, the style, the hope, the perseverance. And oftentimes when Africa can be portrayed, not by everybody, it can be in a less than a a pleasant position. And I was so proud to be attached uh, to uh, this brand. Lem Lem is a beautiful color. You can find it at your local Annie Sonsakis. We have it. Um, Everybody knows we have the paint until the end of the month, so we have that color. I don't think I have any more questions for you, Annie. Oh. I I wanted people to really get a sense of who you are, um, a woman that I admire very much, um, and I do consider a very strong role model, not just in the paint, and that's what I wanted to talk. I have used and watched you work over the years in so many different ways. I have used your experiences in my own life. Um, so I want to publicly thank you for the support that you've given me and on the Purple Couch um, over the past five years. It's been an honor to have been your stockist. Um, and I look forward to many more years of friendship and hopefully more collaboration. Definitely. I definitely want to do that by here. And thank you. And thank you for your words of support for the uh, thing I did with Ethiopia because it was your words that made me do it in the way I did that thing. So thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Everyone, I am really excited. And thank you, Annie Sloan, once again. We're going to sign off and enjoy this nice hot weather in Tallahassee, Florida. All right on the Purple Couch family.